Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 25th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Markowitz, I'm the chair, and we'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Markowitz? Present. Ms. Barnum? Present. Ms. Rebecca Pichetti? Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Long Coughlin? Present. Mr. Dan Meyer? Mr. Howard Moore, Mr. Susan Baugh, Mr. President, Mr. President. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next item on the agenda, I will just note for the record that this meeting is being um, audio and video recorded by Northampton Community Television. Um, and also now ask if any um, school committee members have any announcements to make. Ms. Burke. Um, I wanted to make uh, an announcement that on May 7th, the Northampton High School will be uh, kind of hosting, but um, celebrating the Eat for Education, where participating restaurants in Northampton will donate 10% of um, their proceeds to the high school. That's May 7th. So I think when you go to the restaurant, tell them that you are connected to Northampton Public Schools and 10% of that will be donated. And also um, on May 10th at Forbes Library, the Northampton High School Student Art Exhibition will have its opening and that's from five to seven. The Northampton Art Student Exhibition will be on from May 2nd to the 29th, but the opening is May 10th, again from five to seven. Okay. Can I ask a question about the announcement? Sure. Is the is May also the one at the high at the middle school the art opening, or is it the same one at the high school? I, I am agree. so sorry that I don't have JFK one. I think on that's May tenth, four to six. They're opening too. Four to six. Sorry. Okay. Any other announcements, uh, Ms. Busanski and Ms. Fallon? I just want to let people know that uh, Wednesday, May 1st, is the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Day on the Hill. We'll be advocating for, I think, what we all agree is more funding and other needs of our school department. I'm really happy there'll be four of us going, Mr. Kaufman, Ms. Burnham, Ms. Fallon, and myself. And I know others like to go but can't join us. We have meetings with both our representative and senator who are um, you know, working hard on our behalf, but I think it's important to show face and really have that discussion um, and join with along with other school committees in doing what we need to do to, to see if we could ever change anything at the state level. So, But I try to remain optimistic. So that's Wednesday, May 1st. Thank you. Ms. Fallon. Um, so you all should have received this in the mail. Um, we have the opportunity, if anyone's interested, to submit resolutions. It's a June 1st deadline. Um, resolutions to be considered at the Massachusetts Association of School Committees um, Delegate Assembly in November. Um, so if anyone feels strongly about something, we would need to bring that to the May meeting for a vote um, so that we could submit it for the June 1st deadline. Also, you have the opportunity to sign up for mass, uh, MASC committees. Um, for the last two years, I've been serving on the legislative committee, the resolutions committee, um, the federal, Relation, federal relations network, the advocacy committee, the nominating committee, and as an MIA rep, I would love it if any of you were interested in signing up for any of these committees. I'm happy to talk about what's involved, the time commitment, the location, anything, if you want to get in touch. The deadline for that is June 1st. Thank you, Ms. Fallon. Any other announcements? I would just add my own announcement, which is that um, some of you may know that I've been having a series of town hall budget meetings around the city, um, uh, including at Leeds Elementary School on Tuesday night and last evening right here at JFK in the community room. And I'll be having the third installment of it on Monday, um, April 29th at 7 p.m. Um, at the Northampton Senior Center uh, downtown. So again, appreciative of the folks who've come out to, um, to talk with me about the budget, the first two hearings, and, and we'll have another opportunity on Monday. Okay, so now we will um, move from announcements to the public comment period. Um, and I believe uh, we'll get the sign-up sheet. And as we often do, we ask people to please um, state your name and address for the record, and um, and I will keep a three-minute timer uh, just so that we have the um, ability to let everyone have an equal opportunity to make their public comment. 
Um, the first person who is signed up this evening is Paula Rigano Murray. Hi, I'm Paula Rigano Murray. I live at 45 Finn Street, Northampton. I'm the ESP chapter co coordinator. And um, I would like to just quickly talk about the compensation and classification study that the city did with the Collins Center out of UMass Boston. I want to thank Mayor Narkowitz for answering my questions last night um, on this with regard to budget impact. Um, and here's what I'd like to point out. Based on average tax bill and comparable property values, the Collins Center chose 12 municipalities to compare Northampton's city employee wages with in an attempt to establish external equity. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out who to compare ourselves with. And in, um, but uh, here, UMass did it for us. Um, so I didn't have a lot of time to work on this today, so I decided to take average teacher salaries because those were the easiest to access. Um, for those same 12 communities that were identified by the Collins Center. Greenfield was the only district to pay less on average than Northampton by a, just under $1,500. The other 11 cities paid between $2,500 and $17,000 more on average per year. So what does this tell us? Whether you look at the state the county, comparable school districts, or the municipalities that the Collins Center chose, it comes down to our educators are woefully underpaid. And as we have said over and over again, we're losing good teachers to other districts, and we're not attracting teachers to our districts because our wages are too low. Even the study says on page five, if a city is losing people because of its compensation, it is an indicator that compensation is low. Just because people continue to work in the same position does not mean that the compensation is high. You didn't need a study to tell you that because we've all been saying it for years. Again, I only looked at teachers due to time constraints, but I guarantee you'll see a pattern across all units that's the same. The last thing I wanted to say is that we as a union have been saying for at least the last two contract cycles that I've been involved in that we're getting further and further behind comparable districts. After years of 0%, 0.5%, 1% or in a good year, 1.5%, we're in a hole, really a canyon that the city now has to try to climb out of with regard to school employees. If you don't want to listen to me, then simply read the last line of the study, which states, to avoid falling behind in the labor market, the city should conduct a salary survey every three to four years to determine if the salary ranges are still comparable. So I say to you all, mayor, school committee, um, if you don't start fixing this problem of external wage inequity right now, you're only going to find yourself further and further down that rabbit hole. It's within your power. The time is now for you to do the right thing by your school employees. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next person who signed up is Andrea Agito. Good evening. I'm Andrea Agito. I live in Florence and I'm the niece teacher chapter coordinator. On March 28th, this committee voted to postpone the vote on the budget in order to give us time to negotiate a fair wage increase. We met twice between then and the next school committee meeting, which was April 11th. On the two meetings in between, we offered a fair counter offer. Your committee came back with a woefully disrespectful offer. On April 11th, you all shifted around some funds. Thank you for that. But then you unanimously approved the budget that didn't allow for a fair wage increase. Some have said that we are being adversarial. But I disagree. We are not being adversarial because we all want the same thing. We just aren't going to take the disrespect anymore. And we are not going to be quiet about it. We came to the table with a counter offer that dropped the base wage increase requ requested from 6% to 3% and adding a step each year to bring our salary skill more in line with the surrounding districts. Do you even know what was offered in your name? If you do, you should be ashamed. If you don't, let me enlighten you. The offer that was placed on the table on April 8th 
was that a teacher with a master's degree on the top step would get $50.76 per paycheck before taxes. That's $5.07 a day. An ESP on the top step would get 46 cents per hour. That's $2.99 a day. A clerical worker on the top step would get 12 cents per hour. That's 70 cents, 78 cents per day. A custodian on the top step would receive 13 cents per hour. That's 84 cents per day. And a cafeteria worker on the top step would receive 10 cents per hour. That's 50 cents a day. Whoever composed this offer that was given to us basically shifted around the money and didn't change much, but withdrew the fair offer that was given to our clerical and our custodians, which would be putting them on the city scale. Another example of shame and fear. The other units didn't agree to the package, so we're gonna take back the reasonable offer that we gave to the custodians and the clerical workers. It was trying to pit us against each other. So let me tell you, this is not going to happen. We are standing strong and our actions will escalate. We won't settle one contract until we can settle them all fairly. And we won't be quiet or polite like many times women are expected to do. In this budget, in his budget meetings, in his budget meetings, the mayor said, and I just have one more, one more second to finish. Sure. In his budget meetings and in the newspaper, the mayor said that if this committee negotiates a fair wage increase with NACE, that he will request an added allocation from the city council. The committee doesn't have to shift around the existing money in the budget to negotiate a fair wage increase. So I beg you, please, all of you, not just Downey and Molly, all of you, come to the table on Monday. Let's come to a tentative agreement and so the mayor can go back and get us the money allocated for a fair wage increase. Thank you. The next person who signed up is Heather Brown. I am Heather Brown. I live in Florence and I am the Vice President of the Northampton Association of School Employees. I'm standing up here on behalf of another Northampton teacher who cannot be here tonight because she's at work at her second job. Because of our unfair wages, many teachers are forced to find alternate means of income to make ends meet. If teachers were not forced to do things like work second jobs, they would have more time and energy to devote to their students in the Northampton schools. We're burning out our teachers and therefore denying our students the excellent education they deserve. We have such wonderful teachers in Northampton who are certainly capable of providing this excellent education, but as a result of unfair wages, that uh, education is snatched away from our students. How can we do this? How can we allow our teachers to be overworked and deny them the ability to perform their craft to their fullest potential? Isn't education about the students and providing them with the best education possible? How do officials expect it, uh, teachers to provide this kind of education without sufficient wages and therefore the time and energy to do so? So the, that was the words of this teacher who submitted because she can't be here. And I wanted to note that this teacher is a Grinspoon award-winning teacher. Um, I'm wondering how long you think she'll stay in this situation. So please consider that, that when you're making your decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next person who signed up is Sarah Churchill Windsor. I'm Sarah Churchill Windsor. I am a resident of South Deerfield, Massachusetts, but I teach here at JFK in sixth grade special education. I am here tonight speaking on behalf of someone who could not be here tonight because of family obligations. She is a member of my team. At the middle school, we have teaming and um, she is a recyclone. I am a recyclone, so this is very near and dear to my heart, what she has said. And I quote, 
My name is Laura St. Pierre. I am a sixth grade teacher at JFK. I have attended the last two school committee meetings, NACE bargaining sessions, and the last standout before the mayor's budget present presentation last night. <coughs> however, other, um, however, other obligations have kept me from this event tonight. I would like to speak about the amount of time that teachers spend outside of the school preparing lessons and units, grading tests and papers and projects, entering grades and collaborating with colleagues. All of this time is unpaid. All of this time is because teachers are dedicated, hardworking and caring professionals who do not have enough time during the school day to accomplish these and many other tasks. I have heard discussions there, there, there is a potential work to rule action that may be taken if the school committee and the mayor insist on offering a measly 1.3% raise to our teachers and staff. Some may say that work to rule only makes teaching more difficult for us. This is true. But if teachers truly follow their contract to the letter, many opportunities would be lost for our students. To illustrate this point, I would like to tell you about my last few weeks. A colleague on my team long ago planned a trip to Ghana in Africa. Our students spent a year writing pen pal letters to students in a village there. That educator, Phil Cody, went to Africa during April break and began setting up videos, slideshows, and contacts with local visitors. While he was there during break, he and I were in near daily contact planning for video conferences for this week. We spent that week before his trip setting up with our technology specialist, John Cresatelli. I planned how to integrate his material from Ghana into my opening weeks of our Africa unit. This all came to fruition this week. <coughs> our students were able to watch a tour of a local Ghana Ghanaian home. They saw slides from Mr. Cody's first days in Ghana. When we video conference with a regional chief and se several students were able to say hello live to their pen pals. The superintendent was there during this video conference. Seems like that must be a pretty important thing that happened. This is a unique and enriching experience that would not have been possible without time spent out of school to organize. This kind of planning goes above and beyond. Our students are so lucky that they were given this opportunity. Moving to work to rule as an action would have made this amazing experience absolutely impossible. Please consider the message you are sending to the teachers when you offer this very small raise. As it stands, the message is that our time and our knowledge is not valuable and that we are not worth it. Thank you. The next person who signed up to speak is Dinah Mack. been teaching at JFK for 14 years. Um, I've learned a great deal about my colleagues uh, in the past month of listening to public comment. I imagine all of you have as well, and I hope you have taken in all of the stories um, to your heart. I know that I have. It's been a very moving month, um, two months, actually. Um, I've attended these meetings. I've spoken to the city council, and last night and the night before, I attended the mayor's budget town hall. And I've gotten a pretty clear overview of your budget process. All of this has left me with one underlying question. Did any one person during this whole budget process, Superintendent Provost, Mayor Narkowitz, members of the school committee, um, the building principals on the leadership team, my building principal at JFK, did any one of you consider making wages a priority in this contract here? Or were you all equally complicit in thinking that a 1.3% wage increase was acceptable and fair? Either you all agreed to this, that a 1.3 wage increase was acceptable, or maybe some didn't ask, or maybe one person set this wage increase and no one challenged it. Not one person. That would be very disheartening to me. I don't know the process by which this 1.3% was created. I would like to believe that my building principal, that people who are voted on the school committee, that the superintendent, that the mayor, would have priori prioritized a wage increase. Okay? But I'm feeling like it wasn't a priority. 
or no one stopped the process. There was no, as Lawrence Ferlinghetti said, there was no Buddha in the woodpile to say this is not right, this is not okay. Um, I imagine maybe that it was just assumed that teachers would accept this wage increase because frankly we have accepted it in the past. But our acceptance does not make it morally right. Our acceptance does not make this acceptable. Um, I can tell you honestly that I have never seen people more fired up and at the same time morale so low in this district in the 14 years that I have been here. At JFK alone, four of my colleagues are planning to leave at the end of this year and they are very dear to me. Two others have told me they are seriously considered leaving and this is just at JFK. Okay, so I don't know. Actually, I know others at Leeds. I know others at the high school. But I work at JFK. Um, I can say that each of you can actually do something about it by negotiating a fair wage to your school employees. So again, you can all do something about this. Or you can choose not to do something about it. Apropos, I'm almost done. Apropos of nothing today, a student at the end of a class gave me a note, randomly, that said, Miss Mack is friggin' awesome. And somehow got everyone in class to sign it. Don't know why in this day she handed me this note. My students think that I'm friggin' awesome because I treat each one of them with dignity, care, respect, and I lift them up every moment of every single day for the past 14 years that I have been here. That is the commitment I have to this profession. It is why I do it. Okay, I sleep really well at night. So I walk my truth every single day. I'm just gonna end by saying that wages matter. Okay, wages matter. Words matter, but wages matter. And you all have the power to respect your workers on Monday. I see that. Mr. Meyer, who is one of the major negotiators, is not at this meeting. I also saw that he was not present at an earlier school committee during public comment. I don't know his business, I don't know why, but you are all here and I appreciate that. As Andrea said, please come Monday, use your voice. Okay, you passed a budget, I know a few of you have felt very badly about that. Please come, make this right. Okay, thank you. The next person who signed up is Beth Adams. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Beth Adams. I live on Crescent Street in Northampton and I am a math teacher at Northampton High School and this is my 19th year of teaching there. I love my town, I love my school and I love my job too but it is a very demanding job and I am really surprised after 19 years to be earning so much less than my peers in neighboring districts. I have seen many contracts negotiated in this district and there have always been reasons, good reasons it seemed, and I still think they were good reasons, why we had to accept years of very low percent increases or zero. It always seemed to be a choice between cutting programs and positions or giving us raises. I understood the decision to keep programs and positions. My own three kids were going through these schools and I valued and still do all that's available in our schools. I attended Mayor Narkowitz's budget meeting on Tuesday night. It was excellent and very informative. I've always heard how the state funding formula hurt our school district, and his presentation made this more clear to me than it has ever been before. I encourage anyone who has not been able to be at one of these meetings to attend the one he will hold this Monday at the Senior Center. It is clear that the state is not doing its part to fund our schools, and while we need to fight for change at the state level, this problem has existed my entire career. Our city has had to cope with it during very lean years, hence the zeros and very low percent increases that have not added up to much over the years. I have not received a step increase since I reached step 11, which was six years into my 19 years because I started with five years of experience. So since my sixth year of teaching here in Northampton, 13 years ago, I have received a zero or a very low percent increase. 
This explains the large gap between my wage and that of a peer in neighboring districts, many of which fare far better under the state's funding formula, I realize. I also just learned the other night that in recent years, our city has been increasing the school budget by about 3% a year. That money has gone towards new positions and programs. I believe I heard, and I may be wrong on this, but I think this is what I heard, that 53 new positions have been added in the last seven years. While that shows a commitment to supporting our schools, it is past time to support those of us who have been here, are still here, and hope to stay. It is simply not okay for Northampton to make financial choices that allow school employee wages to remain lower than other city employees and lower than state averages. This may mean adjusting the pie chart that represents the city budget and allocating more city money to the schools. This seems to be a year when there is actually a bit of money to decide what to do with, made clear by the plan to hire new staff yet again. I am well aware of the needs in our district, but you must take care of us as your first priority. And by us, I do not mean just teachers, I mean all of the employees in the Northampton Public Schools. It is intolerable that any of our employees should be, re be receiving hourly pay lower than minimum wage. This morning, one last thing, when I logged into my computer, the school's website came up on my screen. The text on the front page of that website says that Northampton Public Schools has, in quotes, a dedicated and talented staff of teachers and administrators working in a community that supports and values education. The teachers and employees of this district do not feel supported or valued when our wages are significantly lower than those of our peers doing the same jobs in neighboring districts and across the state. Our initial request for 6% increases for each of the next three years would only start to catch us up. How can you give us less? Thank you. The next person who signed up is Garrett Adams. I'm uh, Garrett Adams. I'm an ESL teacher in the district, and I'm married to Beth. And between us, we represent K right up to 12. Um, and I want, I'll want i start by thanking you again, because I really do appreciate what you're doing and that you do it. But I know you're hearing how frustrated we are and I know that you have not seen my wife here in front of you very often I really am here tonight to ask you with a really passionate heart to think of our lowest paid employees as an ESL teacher I shadow my students and I follow them throughout their day to see that they are all right and have access to what's going on and are on an equitable footing with their peers and that starts at the bus, and it ends at the bus. That's the beginning and end of the day. Then it's in the cafeteria with cafeteria workers at breakfast and at lunch. In the classrooms, educational support professionals are making sure that they have food and clothing and teaching them with words, which is my job, but I'm not there because I'm 0.4 at one school and 0.6 at another school, but how to do things and giving meaning. But I think that it's a no-brainer right now in this climate for Northampton to lead Massachusetts in leading an equitable, livable wage. And 15, if, if, 15 does, if 15 for everyone doesn't come out of this, that seems crazy to me. And 6% should come out of it for our lowest paid employees and however close you can get to 6% because you've heard that it's not comparable. I'm going to add in there that these jobs, custodian, bus driver, cafeteria, clerical, those jobs exist in the public sector. But there's a tip jar when you say, whose grilled cheese is this? And they don't have to say, I can't read your name. When the custodians are working, they're working with and next to children. It only takes a few minutes in a school building, in the office, to see how much our clerical staff is doing. They are teaching. And we had a school bus drill this morning 
And I, as I walked out there with the kids to get on the bus, I said, you guys are in luck because I know this driver and he is a superhero. He sends kids home in one piece, physically and emotionally, every day from Bridge Street School, and I'm out there making sure that they get there physically and emotionally and educationally, and he's educating too, right until they get right home to their parent educators. I know you hear us. Do what's right. So um, that's the list that has been signed up tonight. Um, is there anyone who didn't make it in time to sign up for the list? Okay. Okay. If you want to just come forward and um, give me your name and address. My name is Karen Baker. It's K-A-R-I-N Baker. Um, 32 Black Birch Trail. I didn't know that I was going to be able to come tonight. I don't have anything prepared, and I'm not typically the person who has uh, the ability to, to wing it, but I'm going to do what I can because I think this is important. Um, I am a parent of two kids uh, in the district. Um, one it goes to this school in sixth grade. The other is in the high school. They've both been in the district since they were in kindergarten. Uh, we've been very happy with all of our teachers. They've either been somewhere between good and, you know, way beyond good. Um, very good experience with all the teachers, many of whom are in the room right now. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll put that out there. Although I don't think it's necessary to say that because I think I've heard that said over and over. This is the third one of these meetings that I've gone to. And I'm kind of confused because it appears to me that people are saying more or less the same thing each time. And it seemed pretty clear to me the first time that uh, the teachers are great, the uh, whole support personnel in the school district is great, um, they're being underpaid, they earn way less than what comparable districts all around the area do. Uh, that's upsetting to me. Um, I've heard a lot of people say in various contexts that's embarrassing. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem right. Um, they deserve more. It's not even just about showing that we value them, but it's just right. They should be earning a reasonable uh, wage for the work that they do. And if other school districts can do it, we should be able to do it. And if there is something different about the funding formula, maybe that was implied here, we need to figure out a way to make up the difference. There's no reason why they should get paid so much less. Um, it seems like the determination in the teachers is increasing, uh, and I should stop saying just teachers. The determination in the union is increasing. Uh, this is the first time I've heard people talk about work to rule. I that would that would have an impact on my student my my children's education, but I support it. They need to do something. Something needs to change, and if nothing that has happened so far is working. That would be the next step. If they need to take it farther than that, I would support it. And I know other people who would. Um, so I'm asking you to figure this out. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if you could just state your name and address for the record. Yep, I'm Beth Brady. I live in Hatfield, but I teach here in Northampton at the Hatfield Road School. Um, I'm the district's math recovery champion, and I've trained uh, probably, well, most of the K, K to 5 staff in math recovery. And several of those teachers, with this awesome training that we've had, have left the district. <coughs> Not sure why, could be because of the pay <laughs> that we're, we're getting. Um, we, Northampton has these amazing initiatives. Math recovery is one of them. And as a result of math recovery, I get to work with amazing teachers in my building and throughout the district. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I've been here for 26 years, and I want to stay. But given my training and, and what I could be doing, like getting paid for to be a consultant, I'm sure I could be making a lot more. But I choose not to. I choose to be here. Because Northampton has amazing teachers. And they're all so dedicated. And they, they just come to the classrooms and see how many of you have walked into a classroom and spent a day and seen what these teachers do? 
they educate our kids, they care about our kids, I do too. It's just, it's an amazing place to work. And, you know, I've been to several, all of the um, convocation um, speeches, and Mayor Narkowitz, you talk about your children coming to our schools. And I just wonder, before you were in your mayor's shoes, did you look at the teacher's salary and go, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. I just really wonder what you thought of when you first saw the salary. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Bernhard. I'm an English teacher at Northampton High School. Um, like Beth Adams, I do not often walk up to a microphone. Um, I was raised to hold down the fort, and I used that expression last night at the budget meeting, and immediately thought, is that PC? No. Um, but my mom always used to say when she left me alone at home with my brothers, hold down the fort. And um, that is what our staff at all of these schools do. They hold down the fort. We have our jobs, we have our job descriptions, but we are always um, organically working together trying to help each other out. And <clears throat> it's joyful, we're proud of our work, but it is exhausting. And um, I was really moved by the woman who spoke at that first big, I think it was a school committee meeting, um, when the room was packed and it was really hot and we were in the library. And this woman came up and she was very put together and she said she'd been teaching 20 years at a private boarding school and she moved here. I'm sorry, I don't even really know what she teach, I th uh, teaches. I think it might be special education. And she talked about the cut in pay and how that has compounded. And what really got me was when she talked about her own children. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when she gets home at the end of her day, she's wiped out. And her kids are ready for her to be their mom. And it is really tough to give so much emotion at school and intellect and support and um, organization. Um, and then to go home and try to raise your children. Um, this year, my oldest kid is at the high school. She's a freshman. And um, for the first time, she has seen me in my teacher role for real. And she's kind of like, wow, mom, you know, some of these kids, they think you're the goat. They think you're awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, you know, it feels really good. And uh, for years at Northampton High School, I taught all freshmen. Um, and that was such a joy. But the last five or six years, I've been teaching juniors and seniors. And that's its own joy. Um, and at lunch, I found myself talking with Sue Crago, my department chair and colleague uh, who teaches AP language and comp at the high school. And she invited me in to teach that about four years ago. And um, we write a lot of college letters. I wrote, I think, 35 this year, all told. I think she, did she write 60? OK. 60, more than any guidance counselor. Yeah. Right. Yep. No, Biggs, I'm with you. And you write a lot, too. Not that OK. <laughs> it's because you're tough. Um, anyhow, we teach college writing workshops. We teach the college essay. We lead these kids off onto their next adventure. Um, we're intellectuals, but we do need to pay our bills. Um, and I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who said it, but we come here each time and people say the same thing. And I know we're working together. I don't even know how much I'm preaching to the choir. It's so weird, you know, talking and seeing you listen. Um, but thank you for listening, and um, let's work together to try to make this right. Ms. Biggs. Hi, that's it. Susan Biggs, uh, 98 Deerfield Drive. Uh, I teach at the high school. I have a daughter who's graduating from Smith in a few weeks who went through um, from Bridge Street School right through to the high school, and uh, same, watched me be the teacher. I coached uh, four years. Well, I coached 19 years of lacrosse. I've been in HAMP. Uh, now this is my 20th year. I've been teaching for 38. Um, and 
there's so much to say, and I want to echo Diana. First of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, it's a hard job. It's astounding that you sit here for whatever the measly pay is that you get till 11 and midnight. And uh, yeah, I, I can't do it while I'm teaching, but it's amazing. Secondly, I want to echo how much I've learned about my colleagues. I feel like we should do this once a month. <laughs> Find out our struggles and our joys and our... So, where to begin? Shame on us for 19 years. I sat in two, maybe three, but I think only two. And then there was a bunch of superintendent searches too that I sat on. And, you know, it had to be private. I didn't know why. I asked, why are we private? Well, it's the way we do things. So I'm glad that it's not this year and we can actually talk about it. Um, but shame on us for accepting that. But we're teachers. We do hold down the floor. We take one for the team. But I, too, want to echo, when did you not think about, wow, they're pretty low paid. We're, that gap's getting wider and wider. And, you know, some of us, Every time someone stands up and says, if I would go somewhere else, I'll get more. And I just sit back there thinking, yeah, they're thinking, just go ahead. We'll replace you. And I have no bones to not understand that I am completely replaceable. I get that. Not one of us can't be replaced. Who knows what you'll get, but we can be replaced. So I, too, went on school spring for the first time. And this job in Lexington, I did not apply yet, but it's, it's on my radar. Now, no, they might not hire me, right? I'm an expensive hire. I don't need to live in Northampton. My kid got the, the Benny of being at Smith for four years, got a nice uh, scholarship that they give. Used to be free, now it's half price. But if not now, when, Mayor? When, when is there ever, when is that ever going to stop and start to close in? It's just, you know, in our day, I walked in the building at 6.08 this morning and I walked out at 5.35. So if you think we're not putting in extra hours, and there may be some that aren't, and some that need to go to another job, I do my other job in the summer and on weekends and make a lot at it, but if not now, when? Thank yeah. you. I do, I did notice, I took my jacket off because I noticed I have, we go to the Olympiad every year and do very well, we won again this year. AP Chem has all the solutions. This is last year's shirt. Let's find some. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's hard to fo follow Biggs. Uh, my name is Kathy Keough. I'm not from town, I live in the Quabbin School District. I teach computer science at the high school. Um, so I'm a com former computer science professional and um, I've moved into the teaching field. When I started here six years ago, I taught one computer science class. I am now a full-time computer science teacher and I also mentor the robotics team as a good example for a female in STEM field. I've enjoyed my colleagues, I enjoy what I do and I enjoy teaching here. But this fall I'm gonna have two kids in college. And honestly, I think Looking around on school spring, it would be hard for me to find a position where I get paid less than I do here. That's a big point of data to me and a point of respect for what I do. That's what I have to say. I wasn't going to speak because I've spoken before. My name is Maria Garcia. I live on Spring Street in Florence. But I decided that somehow as much as we've spoken and all of us have been touched by what people have said it seems to be falling unfortunately on deaf ears so i'm going to repeat some things that people have said but it needs to be said because i think it has to be part of the public record this little part is called did you know did you know that esps don't get paid when schools are closed for snow days they have to wait till they make up that snow day at the end of the school year. Their rent is still due. Their car bill is still due. And also, uh, recently I spoke with an ESP who retired after 20 years of service. She receives 40% of her salary. She gets $7,000 a year after more than 20 years of service. How could anybody live on that? That's poverty level. This is, it gets even better. Did you know that the other day in the teacher's room, teachers 
ESPs were sharing information as to how and whether they could apply for food stamps. And how do you get Section 8? Are we Walmart? Is this how we want to treat our workers? That they have to get on food stamps and get Section 8 in order to survive, to teach our children. I think it's terrible. And I say this not because there's any shame in it, because they have the right to have their basic needs met. The shame is on the city that makes people do this after working at one or two jobs. People work summers, they do summer school, they do bus, they do everybody. There are people, ESPs who come to the after school program and work every day at the after school program. And still, they're making $7,000 a year when they retire. The latest contract would offer some workers $3 below minimum wage. Is that really who we are in Northampton? To offer people $3 before, below minimum wage to work in our schools with our children? And we say we value education? I think that's horrible. It's absolutely shameful. Teaching is a very personal, powerful, emotional experience. When a student comes to us and doesn't understand a concept, we stay up nights trying to figure out how we can present the information to make it understandable to them. When students are missing basic things, shoes, coats, socks, boots, we find a way to get those things for them. And I think we're at the point where we care for kids and what feels terrible is I get the feeling you don't care about us. And I'm just so frustrated. It's the little things. To not have let the union president get out of the classroom be our full-time president with the funds available, that's unacceptable. To, to suggest that teachers cannot leave the building during our lunchtime that we don't get paid for, that is unacceptable. So you don't want it to be adversarial, either do I. People have concerns about fiscal responsibility, so do I. I want to pay my bills, I want to pay my taxes, I want to be able to get to work in a car that starts up every morning. And I feel like we have gone beyond talking. I am ready for action, and I know that lots of other people are ready for action. So it's time for you to do what is right, what is fair, what is just, and things that you don't have to feel ashamed of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, thank you all for, for sharing your comments with us this evening. Um, we, um, we now move on to the recommended actions portion of the agenda. Uh, where we have several items on the consent agenda, uh, first being the approval of the minutes of March 28th, uh, 2019, the school committee minutes. We also have um, several field trip approvals. We have the JFK sixth grade recyclones going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut on May 3rd, 2019. We have the NHS track uh, uh, going to the Twilight Meet in Weston, Massachusetts, May 4th, 2019. We have NHS track going to the Coach's Invite in Sharon, Massachusetts, May 11th, 2019. We have the JFK Students of Color Alliance uh, traveling to Washington, D.C., June 7th through the 9th of 2019. And we have the Bridge Street 4th grade going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut on June 11th, 2019. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Mayor? Yes. Can I, can we pull the minutes from the consent agenda? I'd like to Certainly can. Offer up a correction. Sure. So um, uh, there's been a request that we'll take the minutes off the consent agenda. So the motion and second and the vote would be on app essentially approving all of the field trip approvals. So all those in favor of approving the consent agenda uh, as amended, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And I'll turn to Ms. Busansky and ask her to make any uh, corrections that she would like to the March 28th school committee. Thanks. So in section seven, the last sentence, 
A vote was taken and the motion passed seven to three. It was actually myself, Mr. Kaufman, and Dr. Voss, not Ms. Hennessy, correct? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. This first vote was Dr. Voss and Mr. Hennessy. Yeah. The first, I think the first one is correct. It's just the section seven. Right, right, right. The first one was just the two of us. The second one was the three of you. Yeah. So it was not going to be. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so. Um, Ms. Busansky, would you make a motion to approve the minutes as amended uh, with that correction? Sure. I move to approve the minutes with that correction for the March 28th, 2019 school committee meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the vote to accept a donation. Uh, this is from the R, um, Ryan, uh, R. K. Finn Ryan Road PTO of thirteen hundred dollars, and it's for May field trips. I think you said all there is to say about it. Okay. So this is a, a generous gift from our PTO at Ryan Road to fund school field trips. Is there a motion on that? To accept the uh, donation, the amount of thirteen hundred dollars for May. May field trip. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion or questions? Um, hearing none, all those in favor of accepting that uh, gift from the Ryan Road PTO, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next item on the agenda is a report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, and this would involve a first reading on policy IKF, which are the graduation requirements for the district. And I will turn it over to the chair, uh, Ms. Fallon. Um, yes, yeah, so the history department at the high school um, brought to us um, a proposed revision of the graduation requirements. Um, previously, we had made a change um, for the class of 2020 and subsequent classes. Um, for a new sequence of World History One, World History Two, or the Honors AP European History Equivalent, and then U.S. History Two, or the AP Equivalent. Um, what is being proposed is for the class of 2023 and subsequent classes, three sequential history classes, three credits, which must be U.S. History One, U.S. History Two, and then World History One. Um, and the only other change that we made was a minor one um, in calling it three sequential history classes rather than social studies. Um, as far as I know, someone is available to answer questions from the history department by phone if anyone has them. Okay, um, so I'm not sure if the committee has questions about the proposed changes. Um, Dr. Provost? I have something and maybe this is something to wait for a kid on, but I believe we said that the honors or AP equivalent would be um, acceptable for world hit, uh, for any of these courses besides U.S. History 1. So you're saying, I'm sorry, just to clarify, you're there saying might be, U.S. History there might be equivalent. I believe there were some equivalent courses after World History 1 that are supposed to be listed. Right. But everybody takes U.S. History 1 and then That's after right. that. So are we waiting for? She's, I've been texting her and I told her to call her now, so we're waiting for her to call. Okay. It is just a first reading, so in the event that it doesn't work out, we'll make sure that someone is available to answer questions for the second okay. reading. Oh, well, she here she is now. Hi, Kate, can you hear me? I can. Okay, she is. <laughs> um, is this Kate out? No, this is... Um, Fountain. Hi. Um, so, uh, Ms. Fountain, thank you for calling in. You're actually um, uh, in the middle of a school committee meeting, and we are discussing the modifications to the graduation requirements, and specifically the modifications to the history um, requirements. And we just wondered if you'd be able to provide us some information on on um, why these changes are, are important and necessary. Okay, sure. So, State has revised the framework for social studies from K through 12, and part of the reason they did that was Massachusetts was one of the few states that did not have a civics requirement. 
And so over the summer, myself and a JFK uh, CTL and teacher went to a conference put on um, by the collaborative along with the state, and they went through the new requirements. And so for the high school, uh, they are asking high schools to teach US 1 in ninth grade, US 2 in 10th grade, and then World 1 and 2 beyond that point. So currently, US 1 is taught in 8th grade, and so because 8th grade is now required to be civics, we have to move US 1 to 9th grade, US 2 to 10th grade, and then World will be to be determined for grades 11 and, for grades 11 and 12, potentially. So at this moment, we're asking for a, a shift in graduation requirements for US 1 to US 2 and World to be determined. Okay, Dr. Provost. Okay, just before you came on, I had asked a question and looking over the uh, version of the policy we have in front of us. I believe I recall from our discussion that some of these courses may have AP or honors equivalents, which would also be acceptable. Am I correct on that? Yes. And can you just identify so which ones those are? Students could take AP US history uh, instead of um, the sophomore year US 2. And then students junior year or senior year could take AP Euro, AP European history, in the place of their world history requirement. Thank you. So we could just add those sort of parenthetically as an alternative to those, to mm -hmm. those years? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any um, questions uh, for Ms. Fountain while she's on the line? Ms. Voss. Hi, uh, this is Susan Voss speaking, and I'm just curious if you look ahead to this, I know world history right now is taught during the freshman year. As far as I know, there isn't any sort of honors flavor of it, but if students are gonna be have the option of taking that their junior year, do you think that AP Euro, it, it's clearly a great class, but is it comparable, or are we losing something for those students who might choose to take AP Euro but not have the chance to study a larger portion of the world at the level they want to? Well, uh, one of the great things about the AP European History <coughs> course is that in order to understand European history, you have to be able to look at uh, histories of other parts of the world that are related to it. So for instance, if you're talking about the Crusades, you're talking about the Middle East as well. If you're talking about uh, the spread of communism, you're going to end up touching on what happens in China. So it, it does incorporate enough of the world standards to, to meet the requirements. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions um, uh, while we have uh, Ms. Fountain on the line? Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Lonnie Kaufman. I'm wondering, when the, do you have any insights as to when the state will implement a social studies MCAS? And if so, how would this align? How would this sequence of courses align with what will be on probably a 10th grade social studies event? <clears throat> so at this point, the state is being really quiet and they're not giving out a whole lot of information, but they have put together a team to start practicing and preparing a test. And their goal, I believe, the last I knew, was in two years to be running a test. So they have a timeline. Um, but they haven't told us much. It's been suggested when we were at the conference over the summer that there could be an eighth grade assessment for civics. And then it was suggested there would be a US history assessment. But they didn't tell us which year. Mm -hmm. But based on the new frameworks, um, you know, if US history is supposed to be taught the first part in ninth grade and the second part in 10th grade, it would be reasonable to assume. But we really, at this point, we really don't have that information. We just know that, and they said there are assessments coming. That's, that's all they've really told us. Okay, thank you. So you've, you, 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 you're doing your best you can with limited information, but this doesn't sound like it's going to be a conflict to you. And have, do your fellow staff agree? Or has anybody no, expressed I, any no, large in, concerns? In my professional opinion, I would say that the reason the frameworks have shifted is to prepare, well, it's to make sure students have civics education and that they cover the history of the world and the history of the United States, first and foremost. But I believe that part of the reason they shifted the order or the pathway is because they're planning on an assessment. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other, um, any other comments or questions about this on first reading? 
If not, we want to thank you very much for calling in, uh, Ms. Fountain, and thank you for the work you've been doing to help us uh, make sure that our curriculum is aligned properly, and, um, and we'll wait to see what the state does. So thank you very much. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry. That's okay. I didn't like it. I wanted her to Thank go. you. Thank you very much. Um, may I just ask one question about it? Sure. This, because um, on one of the bullet points it says culinary arts, and I don't think that we have culinary arts at the high school anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in case. You keep it on <laughs> just in case? Or should we? Take that was the general idea, I think, when we mm -hmm. last when we looked at this on. policy. Does it confuse? Families when they come to our school and see that and then never have an offering I, I sort of feel like that's kind of tough personally If I had a kid that was really excited about culinary arts, mm -hmm. and I was like oh look you'll be able to take culinary arts No, actually you won't but I'd it's be on a piece of fine paper. with removing it when we vote at the next meeting mm -hmm. I, mean, I would like you you all to discuss it. Sorry that's, yeah. you know. Ms. Hennessy. I really agree with that. I didn't even think of that actually and now I Thinking of my own daughter, who's going to be really excited to see that. I, mean, the, I think it's a good point. Um, I would be absolutely supportive of taking removing it. So remember that next month. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Busansky. Well, to that point, do we have? Um, I mean, a bunch of these courses. Obviously, we have psychology, but I mean, what would be the physical health, social and emotional health, safety and prevention, personal and community health? Classes that they would take. What are those two additional courses really? It's like wellness. Stuff. Looks like, but wellness happens in grade nine yeah. or ten. Doctor. So I can answer that list of topics are the topics that will satisfy the PE requirement, mm -hmm. PE slash wellness requirement. So they're all listed in there because the activities that the classes participate in over the course of the four years are not all. They're continuing to be developed. I think we're up to juniors now who will be compliant with the requirement to have wellness at all 12 years of their education. But um, we wanted to leave latitude for the activities that are actually selected. So we put the full list of things that they can do with their wellness activities. As you know, the wellness classes after ninth grade, I shouldn't call them classes, the wellness experiences after ninth grade are things like lectures, field trips, um, Seminars, etc. So those are all covered within that list of activities. Got it. So it does seem it does feel kind of misleading in a way because again, if you're talking about earning 28 credits, and you know, again, going for people going into the schools, and there's only 32 credits over the four years, and these aren't really two credits in a traditional sense; they're almost non-traditional. Well, they do count as quarter credits if you look down below. Uh -huh. So they take, it, it comes up to one and a half credits out of the sequence. Mm -hmm. So one and a half versus two. It's one and a half out of the 32. Got it. Okay. It just feels different. Yeah. Maybe we could explain it in a better, mm -hmm. more clearer way than the, the way it is explained now. Because I was even looking, I was like, oh my goodness, my son, you know, is a junior. I, he's really never going to graduate. Where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't take these two courses. Is there a way, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Is there a way to look at the language and see? If you can clarify, I mean, our options would be to either amend it at the second reading next yeah. month as a group or to refer it back to the subcommittee. But I thought there was a little bit of an element of time constraint to try and get this decision made in time for the incoming well, freshmen. The incoming freshmen have already selected the U.S. History 1 course. It was just scheduled earlier this week. So um, the goal is to try to have the policy sync up with what they're actually taking. Yeah. I think taking a little bit of extra time wouldn't harm anything, but I also think another option could be if you have suggestions for language changes to email them to the chair of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee so that we could maybe have some ready-made amendments next time. Ms. Foss? Um, I just have a question along these same lines. When it says two additional courses or learning experiences, I think, Dr. Provost, you just described the learning experiences. That's right. And I'm wondering if anyone actually ever satisfies this PE wellness requirement through two courses in these areas. And if they don't, I guess my suggestion would be 
three little asterisks below wellness that address this? So I can't, uh, I can't speak to what all of the individual course selections for our students have been over the years that this has been in place. I would think that by f the vast majority of them have satisfied the graduation requirements through the wellness experiences rather than the courses mm -hmm. because the courses are the other sections of physical education mainly which are highly constricted because we don't really have enough PE teachers at the high school. Did that answer your question or um, at least provide the rationale for the current situation? It helped. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, Ms. Busansky. I'm just curious. So if someone, if a student did take two psychology courses, I mean, many students take two psychology courses at the high school, then they wouldn't have to participate in the wellness experience or take wellness. What would that do? The way it's written now. I believe that a student who was taking psychology could satisfy the graduation requirements and not go on the wellness experience with the rest of the class. Um, I imagine that probably some students taking psychology still do go on the wellness right, right. experiences. I'm just trying to you know, that would really be understand sort of traditional. what the language is saying, just to make sure we're clear. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know that that is our intention, right? That a student would take two psychology classes and opt out of the wellness experience. Well, I don't think I that the policy doesn't forbid it. I don't think it's what we en envisioned, and I don't think that the policy necessarily needs to be changed to forbid it. If, if that's how a student wants to satisfy the wellness requirements, I think it's within the boundaries set up by the statute. So I, mm -hmm. I don't think we necessarily have to be more restrictive than the state is requiring. And could they then also skip out of wellness class? Is that what this is also saying or no? Wellness can't be. Wellness is a required class. That is required. Okay. Which is good. I'm not mm -hmm. arguing the point. I'm just trying to clarify. Ms. Hennessy. I'm sorry for taking up time on this, only because I'm on a committee and I focused <laughs> on the history. And when, this, uh, when you brought up the culinary arts, the one thing that is confusing to me on this, and John, maybe, or Dr. Provost, mm -hmm. we have 28 credits, and then it says course requirements, and everything listed has both, except when you get to wellness, it has how many courses and the credits. Now, wellness is obvious that there are two two courses, wellness one and wellness two, even though they don't mm -hmm. explicitly say that, and how many credits. But then they say two additional courses or learning experience. Do we have a credit equivalent explicitly assigned to that? No, we don't. So there's none? No. So it's, it's just, just the courses. It's, it's ju the courses are the only ones that carry credit. The requirement for the experiences is that you participate. So I think w we need to have that, just for consistency's sake, credits may vary or some phraseology like that, because um, that might be confusing to me if it's a learning experience would be okay or. Yeah. Mr. Kaufman, then Ms. I'm trying to find the uh, most recent high school program of study. That program, I can't seem to do that right now, but um, I know that Ms. Burnham and I had some questions for Mr. Lombardi last time about this new program elementary partnerships, he called it, which is now offered for credit which he answered in a follow-up email after he presented the program of study. So I'm wondering, that's now another course that's offered for credit, Elementary Partnerships, which is a childhood curriculum, child development curriculum and an on-site thing. Where do, does that fit into one of these? Fits into the electives. Well, it's not a requirement. But approximately half of the credits required for graduation are elective credits. Yeah, I know, but I mean, should it, I guess my question is, would it not fit into two additional courses or learning experiences? I don't. Mm. How do you determine? I'm confused. So I, I believe I believe that the focus of the curriculum in those two courses is specifically child development. And I'm not sure that child development falls within the purview of the types of courses that are um, recognized as part of satisfying the PE requirement. I could look into it. Culinary arts and psychology is? Yes, because nutrition is a component of the health requirement and psychology is just explicitly listed in the, in the regulation. <laughs> Ms. Foss? Um, I, 
I'm realizing I didn't understand this. So when it says wellness one and two are 0.25 credits, um, wellness class takes one full period, and I think they get one credit for it. But so what is the difference between so those credits are like the ones that Miss Hennessy was mentioning up above? What is the 0.25 mean? It says at least 0.25 because at the time that this requirement was being phased in, we weren't exactly sure what the um, what the sequence was going to be going all the way through grade 12. At one point, we thought there might be wellness one through four, each with a quarter credit. Um, so that's why the term at least is used there. So the wellness one is a full credit course. Um, so there's really no way to take a 0.25 credit course right now. It goes back. I, I, I'm just realizing it's confusing um, based on our current practice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had one other question. Um, three science classes. Do I re courses? Do I recall correctly that one of them has to be a lab science? Um, I believe that Mass Core requires one of them to be a lab science, but we don't align with Mass Core. So I'm just bringing that up as a possible mm -hmm. conflict between us and them. I, I could be wrong. I just have this memory of that. See the chair is keeping a list of things for us to talk about for second reading. Um, any other comments about this on first reading? Again, this is just our first um, opportunity to look at it and debate it and uh, get questions answered, and then we'll bring it back and we'll have the opportunity to make amendments and vote on it on second reading. Anyone else have anything more to add? Okay. So we will then um, move on to the um, main item on the agenda for this evening, um, which is a presentation and discussion by Dr. Provost of the mid-year screening. I think you have to have the lights in the back. They have to move. I think you want to turn those. Back. They just have to move around. Yeah. So it's too bad that Sarah and Beth are both left because I, would, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about them in my opening remarks and what they said tonight. Um, so I hope someone will um, convey these comments back or at least ask them to watch the presentation. Um, I wanted to thank Sarah for bringing up the, the virtual audience that our students had the opportunity to have with the the parliament chief um, from northern Ghana. That really was uh, a high point of the past couple of weeks for me. Um, and she took what I think was probably my favorite picture of that whole event, which was very well documented, which is me sitting right next to the screen and the caption she had for it was, our chief conferring with their chief. <laughs> pretty, pretty um, and then also, we're going to be talking a lot about AVMR tonight. and. Uh, what I think you'll see is the successes that our students are experiencing because of AVMR. And so I really wanted to thank Beth Brady for all the work that she's done to train our staff. Um, when she called herself a champion, I want you to know that wasn't just sort of a, a moment of self-congratulation. It's actually a term that we use in the AVMR world. Um, champion means that you've attained a level of training that allows you to go out and um, get other teachers certified to provide AVMR interventions. So um, that certainly has been a really um, good success for us. So this is another one of our data meetings. I'll be um, just talking a little bit about the data presented tonight so that you can understand it. And then um, guiding, why is it doing that? Okay. And then guiding um, the committee through the series of questions that we ask for our data meetings. So, um, Go ahead, Annie. The first thing we'll be talking about is the AVMR screenings. Those are um, assessments that are connected to the AVMR intervention that we're using with students in elementary school. It's not our core curriculum, but it is our um, standard protocol intervention for students. Um, we've also had a pilot 
this year at Jackson Street. One of the things that um, we've said all along is that RTI is a framework. It's not um, a cookie cutter approach. It has certain components that must be in place for all um, schools that purport to do RTI, but there are options available within it. So one of the things that's different this year is Jackson Street is piloting using AVMRs instead of the Ames Web measures. So we don't have um, comparable data for all of the schools um, because of that. And for this presentation, we're just showing the, the measures that were common among all schools, although you should know that Jackson Street had more VM, AVMR measures that are not shown tonight, and the other schools had more Ames Web measures which are not shown tonight. Um, the goal is to give some data that was um, comparable across the schools. So, um, to understand these charts, you really have to reference the green sheet that was included in your packets, as well as the pyramids, and work your way back and forth. Um, you'll see, if you look at the AVMR green sheet, for example, in the area of numeral identification, which is what this is, it explains the difference between levels one, two, three, four, and five. So a level, or actually it starts at level zero, a level um, zero student can't identify numerals one through 10. Level one is a student who can identify numerals zero through 10. A level Two is a student who can identify numerals 0 through 20. Level 3 is 0 to 100. Level 4 is 0 to 1,000. And level 5 is 0 to a million. And um, the green, yellow, and red in the triangles represent what our expectations are for students at different times during the year. So you'll see on some of these measures, um, the the expectation doesn't change from September to December because it's kind of a short period of instruction, but on other ones they do because um, we expect students to have made some growth. Um, so, and then the three colors represent um, level of risk that we perceive for students at the various levels. So we perceive both in September and in December any student in first grade who cannot identify numerals zero through 10 as being at high risk. And then students at level two, again, that students who can not identify numerals zero through 20 as being at elevated but moderate risk. And then um, if you can identify one to 100 up to a million, um, we see you as solidly where we would want you to be. So these first sets of charts look at the same students, basically the same students. There is some addition and some loss of students from classes between September and December, but it's substantially the same groups of students. So you can see where they started at the beginning of first grade and then where they were by December. Um, so in this representation, for example, you can see that they were students in first grade at Bridge at the beginning of the year were roughly a third, a third, and a third um, at the three levels of risk. And by December, most of the students were at low risk. Um, there were only a few students in the high risk zone and um, many fewer at an elevated risk. So that's how these charts work. You could flip through until we get to keep going. The next one, which is, okay, you can leave it right there. The next one is forward number sequence. Um, and so just to explain something that might be a little bit tricky in the nomenclature for forward number sequence, and you also see this for backward number sequence, um, you can see that uh, at level two, it says, can produce a forward number sequence one to 10 with NWA without dropping back. That means that they can count from, from one to 10 and you can ask them to start at any number from one to 10 and count on, and they can immediately pick up without starting over from the beginning. Um, so that's um, just information for you to understand what's in the green sheet that explains what the levels are. Um, and so you can see, our, again, where our kids start out. For the forward number sequence, it's level zero and two that we consider to be high risk in September. 
That's um, students who um, basically can um, either can't produce the forward number sequence to 10 or can only produce to 10. Um, level, I'm sorry, at zero or one. Level two are students who can produce to 10 with um, starting at any point and not going back to the beginning. Level three are kids who can count um, on beyond that without dropping back. Level four is counting to 30. Level five is counting to 100. And so you can see what um, our expectations are for the different points in the year, and you can see what um, the risk levels are for that. So just explain how that chart works. And if you continue on, the other measure that's common, if you could stop there, the other measure that's common beyond that is backward number sequence, very similar to forward number sequence, only this, the skill here is to um, be able to produce the sequence backwards starting from any point. Um, so um, this is something that's a higher level skill. It's something that, you know, I'll just take you back in my experience and ask you to sort of travel back in your experience of learning about number. Um, I remember it was kind of a revelation when I, I realized there were fractions in between whole numbers. And then it was a mind blower when I realized there were an infinite number of values between any two whole numbers. Um, and I just felt like, and then later on when I was in high school, I learned about radicals and it's like, Every time I felt like there were whole infinities of number that I had no idea existed. Um, I think for a first grader, working backwards is kind of like that. Um, they're used to counting up things. They're used to, you know, even sometimes singing songs about numbers going forward. But at some point in first grade, we expect them to realize, oh, you can flip it around and the number line can go backwards. Um, so that's the skill that this measures. Um, Okay, so then I'll talk about the Ames web screenings you have available to you. Um, the first one here are the number sense fluency percentiles. You can go ahead one. Um, this is looking at a cohort over years. So these are the current fourth graders at Bridge Street. On the same measure, it shows you what proportion of the group was in each of the percentile bands when they were in second grade, third grade, and fourth grade. It's not exactly the same students because, you know, some students come and go between grade level, but it's substantially the same group of students again. So you can see their progress on this skill over time. Now, this is all compared to national norms. So the national norm group has a higher level of proficiency at each year as they go from second to fourth. And you're seeing how the Bridge Street students compare to the national norm group for the appropriate grade level as they go through. So that's um, this type of chart. You have it for Leeds and for Ryan Road as well. You don't have one for Jackson because they're in that pilot this year, so they don't have um, the Ames Web measures for this. So then, if you could stop there. The other type of measure you have available, it looks very similar, um, so you have to pay attention to the charts, are oral reading fluency percentiles. Again, this is looking at cohorts through time, um, and we do have Jackson Street included in this. So again, it's looking at one class and one school and where they were in comparison to their peer group, nationally speaking, at each grade as they progress through. So um, you really have two types of charts. You have three types of measures because you have both reading and math for Ames Web. The AVMR is just math. Um, those are the pieces of information I bring with me tonight. So uh, my first question is, are there any questions on what the data actually shows or how the charts are set up? Yeah, thank you, John. Just to make sure I understand, so the, the vertical axis on the left, the 0 through 60, that's, let's say, for example, the bar all the way on the left, the blue bar. Are we saying that 15% of students in grade 2 um, scored in the 1st through 10th percentile? 
That's correct. So the left chart is percentage. That's right. And that was two years ago. The blue is two years ago, the orange is last year, and the gray looking or brown is this year? That's right. Okay. And it's moving up grades. So it's, the blue would be when the fourth graders were in second grade, and the orange would be when they were third graders, and now they're in fourth grade, so you're seeing their score as fourth graders right. in the gray. Just another question. So why the, the, you know, the, the, middle, the middle thing there, which the bulk of the students are at, 26 through 74th, that's such a wide span that would be inclusive, I think, of uh, areas of concern as well as areas of excellence? You know, kid who's at 27 versus kid who's at 73, why, why combine those? So these are the uh, bands that Ames Web reports out. Yeah. The 25th through 74th, or 26th through 74th percentile is what they consider the average range. Okay. Um, the 11th through 25th is low average. That's like the sum concern or sum risk. And then the bottom 10% is, is the high risk group. And similarly, the uh, 75th through 89th percentile is considered to be somewhat above average, and the top 10% is considered to be well above average. So this is how they report it? Yeah. Are you, are you open for um, It's really curious that our students are, are have a lot more second graders in that lowest percentile for the reading than for the math, and I'm wondering if that has something to do with the test itself or when it's given or and and along with that it's really great to see that as they progress from first sec to second to third grade that they're improving down at that end pretty systematically so that's fantastic but why what's happening that makes us so weak in that lowest grade that's shown so you're really into two parts of the protocol. Remember, the, the first part is just to describe what you're seeing. So you're seeing that kids start out, generally speaking, with higher levels of risk and have less risk as they go along. Um, that's the observation we look for in the first part of the protocol. The idea of, I would ask you to hold off the question oh, of I'm why. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I would ask you to hold off the question of why until we get to that stage. Okay. Sorry. But maybe that's a good segue into now just saying, okay, if everyone understands, this is the, the period of time to just throw out your observations. And if you want to click over to the one that just loops so that people can see them, go for you because they have them. I mean, I think I'll rephrase it as a question. Is there a difference? Is there any reason to expect kids should do different on the math and the reading in terms of what you know about the tests? No. They're all, okay. they're all, com they're all norm reference tests, so you would expect 10% to be in the bottom 10%, 10% to be in the top 10%, and 50% to be in the middle on both. Okay. So the question again, John, is what? The question she asked, is there any reason why... No, what's possibly... her question to us? Oh, the question is, what do you notice in the data? What patterns? What do you see? Thank you. Um, in the um, number sense fluency, um, in fourth grade, everybody it kind of falls in that middle category across our district um, pretty strongly. There's a, there's a little bit of a, you know, um, yeah, which is, yeah, it's just something that I noticed. <laughs> Um, 
this? I'm back. Would the, if we looked at these data a few years ago, would they have looked similar to this, do you think, or is this different? I really can't speculate. Do we um, not have them? Are they new? So we've been doing RTI, I think, for four years now. We, every year we've made tweaks and adjustments to the assessments we've been given. These are the assessments that have been consistent over at least the last three years. So uh, I just, the, bit, the truest answer is I don't know what they looked like before that. Thanks. Do the time series include, or the, the, so there is intervention, and if there is intervention, where, where are we applying it? Are we applying it, for instance, if we're looking at backward number sequence? How many students are receiving a tier two? So, so these are universal screening measures, so they're given to all students. Some of the students in that group would have received intervention between the, the September and the December measure, um, students in the yellow and red group from September, and many students would not have received intervention. Would we have, su I mean, would we have sufficient resources? For instance, I'm looking at the Jackson Street um, backward number sequence where that yellow two to three range is pretty large. So we're offering, we're offering services or to those in red and those in yellow as available? Is that That's accurate? right. So um, the, the methodology we use is to, uh, in elementary school, pick the students with the greatest risk who are not receiving some other kind of intervention. And then after that, take as many students as possible who are at less risk. We also do um, have a, a large component of professional judgment. Um, sometimes people may say, I don't think this intervention is right for the student because I think there's something else that's blocking. I just want to give some more time. Um, but in general, the, the strategy is to start from the highest risk and work down. Yes. Okay. Well, here, here's an observation now that we're sorry I was sure. not paying attention to the directions. Um, the observation I'd like to make is I've really just focused on the math, the, the second to third to fourth grade progression. And um, our district's doing a really great job um, helping these kids, it seems. So um, the lowest 10% generally goes down from second to third to fourth grade. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, Dr. Provost, you expect 10% of kids to be in there, and by fourth grade, that's very rare. It's a lot lower. So kudos to their teachers. It looks really good. And then similarly, the top 10%, 90th to 99th, again, you'd expect 10% to be in there, and it's generally higher. Yeah, totally agree. I'm, I'm very happy with these, these results. <coughs> You know, segueing from that, you look at Ryan Road, grade three to five, number sense, fluency percentiles, and they go, they have 12% um, in second grade down to, I don't know, what is it, 5% in third grade, and then nothing. <laughs> I mean, they've just shifted, they've just moved those kids so successfully. All right, so moving into the second phase of the protocol we have for looking at data, um, now it's time for interpretation. So we have started that a little bit with what you said, Ms. Burnham, but so what does it suggest to you? That's not just to you, but to the whole. <laughs> <laughs> I feel. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I that is interesting when I look at the patterns too is that it does feel like our schools are very equal in the populations that are coming in. That they're all that they spread out in a certain pattern that looks the same. I don't know if that's a suggestion or not. I don't know if that. Can you say more? I'm not sure I follow. Well, when we look at the when we look at the bar graphs, they are just so similar in all the cohorts. It's interesting that all of our schools are so uh, well balanced in the community that's there, that you have kids that are coming with these different skills, but it's not like one, one school isn't, isn't majorly mm -hmm. out of alignment. Mm -hmm. That's 
not a suggestion. That's not. Doesn't tell me anything that I suggest. Sorry, I didn't answer. No, well, that was uh, you. That was <laughs> you had the suggestion there. You said the the graphs look the same. So to you, that suggests the kids' performance or ability is somewhat the same yeah. among the four schools. When we look at, are we looking at the, um, at the, um, can we comment on the ABMR too? Yeah. So it suggests that there's significant movement between September and December. And, and I don't, you know, I suppose that that would make me ask is this is this a certain amount of developmental um, movement or is, is this all intervention I think if that's a question to me I'd say I think it's both uh -huh. because um, some students were in the green right so they were receiving they would not be a can candidates for intervention right. and the right. question is did they keep up did because the, right. the, the standard changes from September to December, to December. Right. Uh -huh. right. So that I would consider to be just typical growth. If you have students who are moving from a, a yellow to a green or a red to a yeah. yellow, that may be an effective intervention. Right. I mean, that, that's just extraordinary, the AN, AN VR, pretty much. Yes. Are we commenting on the oral reading or just the math right now? You can com comment on anything. <laughs> so I've moved. The, the oral reading, there's some plots from grade one to three from each school and then from two to four, and I'm assuming they're the same thing, they're just a different cohort of kids, right. is that right? Okay. So um, I'm noticing that if you look at the Bridge Street one from grade one to three, um, I don't know when it's gonna fly up there, but um, grade one, two to three improves, um, kids improve, and I'm looking at the lowest mm -hmm. cohort, but they're really high, and then skip ahead to the same school, Bridge Street grade two to four, um, so one grade up, um, looks very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the three to five and the two to four, what do you see as the, the main difference? How would you characterize it? Um, sorry, I think I was looking at that. Yeah, find it. One to three one and to two three. to four. Right. right. To four. One to three. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In the one to three cohort, so those are current third graders, I think. That's correct. I'm reading this right. Mm -hmm. um, the lowest tenth percentile. There's some. There's a very high percentage there. Mm -hmm. um, the highest tenth percentile is about ten percent, for people not looking at, and then. If we skip ahead to the group that is currently in fourth grade, um, the lowest tenth percent is really just hovering around 10%, but they're not changing as much yeah. from second to third to fourth grade, and I guess I think it's minor. It could be different. It could just be a small number, but kids are dropping out of the top percent in that, co in that one. Yeah, so I, I, I see it the same way. I think that the current third grade group came in with um, higher levels of challenge than the current fourth grade group. They've really cut down um, some of the deficits they presented with as first graders, but they still have a way to go. It's district wide, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you squint, you've got a normalish distribution for a lot of these, mm -hmm. and that's the one. That's the only one that's for all three or for all four schools. It's all left skewed. The one to three. Yeah, yeah. they're all left skewed. Then there's a, a really dramatic decline. I mean, you're looking at Jackson Street, you're going from 37 down to 13, and that's across again all four schools. But it's it's just, I've seen classes, you know, individual classes in schools, but to have it come, you know, across the district is 
striking. Well, it would be building on what Mr. Meyer just said, if you had the first grade data from what's currently labeled as second to fourth, it would be interesting to see where those kids were in first grade, because it does seem like it, it really is the first grade that is the particular weakness, and then they are improving. What did they take? This, did they take Ames Webb in first grade? The current students who are the current fourth graders, the first grade group would be beyond that range. Um, the current third graders, we do have their data from first grade. So it's that, here, right? That first grade group for the current fourth graders is sort of beyond the window that we have data on. Yeah. Um, and that's what um, what Mr. Meyer and what Dr. Voss just said is a really good example of stage four of this, which is getting into implications. So it, one of the implications is there's something about the current fourth grade group that seems different from the other groups that have gone through, at least in reading. Well, I think um, to Ms. Burnham's point, I think it's, a, it's really important to understand the growth that we see and the, or the success we see the, with the AMVR, whether that is just naturally kids are going to learn between September and December. That's part of their development. You would expect them, obviously, <laughs> to do better. But the real beauty of this could be to see which of the students that scored in the zero to one that are now in higher did receive intervention. And it'd be a really nice way to look at the effectiveness of, of identifying kids, of adequately providing them with, with the support and how effective the support is, or not. And so this seems like there's enough data there that could actually show our strengths and protect potentially areas that might need a little bit more PD or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's a, good, it's a good set of data, I think, that we have at our disposal that as an implication that would be a next step that would certainly suggest if it hasn't been done already, and it probably has. Could you... Um talk about in the a the MR, um, the backward numbers sequence in all the first grades. Mm -hmm. Could you so, go over that data again from September to December? Because yep. that is, that's, those charts are, I don't know, <laughs> interesting. So uh, I'll, yeah. I'm going to, I'll tell you, I'm sharing some information from Tasha Rimini, who is the math interventionist at Bridge Street School. Um, when I first created these, the backwards number sequence jumped out at me, and I said, you know, how do you explain this? It seems like the backward number sequence is much more challenging for our first graders than the forward number sequence. And she said to me, a lot of kids learn numbers in a rote, um, just sort of um, sequence through repetitive counting, through songs. A lot of them are just sort of going through um, this process of going to the next thing every time you add an item to the group. But to make the leap to, OK, if you're taking things away from the group, it can work backwards um, is, a, is a big leap for a lot of them. It's huge. Right. So a lot of them aren't there in the beginning of September. Um, and by December, a lot of them still aren't there. Um, yeah. But that's, that's really one of the developmental challenges of students yeah. of that age. Yeah, that's what, that's what that one feels really. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe there's something about that plot I don't understand, the backward number sequence. Mm -hmm. and it comes up. See the arrows? I think you said it, and I missed it. Zero to three yeah. under December, yeah. whereas the red is zero to one in September, and it's zero to three. What are those numbers yeah. in the arrows? So the, z the backwards number sequence, let me just pull one of these out so I can have it. But does the zero to three mean what level they're at? So, yes, it does. So the red, we shouldn't really necessarily be, carrying, be comparing the fact that the red got bigger, right? right? Because yeah. well, zero to three is really the, the we have to look at the orange plot. You have to look at the value in the arrow, right? Yeah, and then you have to look at the green sheet and how it corresponds. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, right, that's why I pointed out that for yeah. some of these, the expectation changes from right. September to yeah. December. And yeah. so, um, but still, I say that it, it's worth paying attention to because these are the expectations that we have. Okay. And what it's showing is that some of the kids are not keeping up with the expectations sure. with this skill. Yep. So even though it's a big jump, we want them to be able to make the big jump. Laura? Um, I guess when I'm looking at the 
cohort oral reading fluency percentiles for grades one to three, and I see the number of students in grade one who are in the first to tenth percentile. I do wonder what the correlation is with the students who were who attended preschool programs, um, and I wonder how much of it is students who come in and are still making up for, for lost time, whereas their peers may have had already, you know, a full day preschool program and just kind of potentially have a, a year's head start. Mm -hmm. Well, I might be able to speak a little bit to that because we did the, I forget what the acronym was, but we did the preschool study on availability within the district and found that um, it really wasn't a large number of seats that we needed in order to get to universal preschool exposure. I think that study found that we need probably 30 more accessible seats in the city. Um, so kids come with a lot of preschool experiences um, for the most part, but the preschool experiences of, are of many varying kinds of um, experience. So. Uh, I guess on the one hand I can say I think most of them have had preschool. On the other hand, I can't say what they've gotten in terms of skill development in preschool. Yes. Um, just looking across the reading and the math, I am surprised to see the relative levels of them because looking at the older kids' data in our district, um, some of the average MCAS data and the average SAT data, our district always seems to be stronger in reading and less strong in math, but as far as I can tell, these data, we look stronger the other way around. The math scores are um, a lot fewer kids struggling in math than in reading at this age. Is that, is that your view too? Yes, but I'll, I'll offer some opinions about that. It's important to remember that MCAS and SAT are much different kinds of measures than these are. Um, these are looking at the underlying skills. Um, and so it, it, to me, is saying that the underlying skills for this group in math at this point, I think, are stronger than the underlying skills in reading. Um, the other thing that I would um, point out is that math has been a real focus of intervention and, and efforts to, to make improvements at the elementary level. So that doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, when Beth Brady talked about the you know many teachers she trained in AVMR mm -hmm. that was all part of this effort to really focus on building basic skills um, for math and I'll tell you just personally although I'm not an AVMR expert the thing that excited me about the program not that I was responsible for bringing it in but the thing that excited about me when I heard it was I remember for years going to conferences and people saying that we think that number sense is going to be the math equivalent of phonological awareness. In other words, we know that kids who have reading problems, lots of times it's because they don't have underlying phonological skills. Um, and there was a suspicion for many years that kids who struggle in math don't have underlying number sense. So like the thing that um, distinguishes kids who are going to succeed in math from those who don't are the ones that are successful when they see a math problem. It's almost like in the back of their mind they flip over to a number chart and they can see where things are going. Um, kids who don't have um, that sort of internalized number sense really have a much harder time. This is the first intervention I've seen that tries to build that internal number line or number chart, if you will, for kids who don't naturally have it. And so I think that may be why we're seeing some stronger um, results there. Yes, Laura. Um, I guess the other question I would have is when we're looking at the reading data versus the math data at the lower levels, does it the does the percentage of students who are English language learners, it seems that it would be easier to, to do this lower level math for an English language learner than it would be to have that oral fluency, reading fluency. And so I don't know if that's skewing it or not. I don't think I can speculate on that. Um, one of the things we know is that kids who are English language learners often struggle in math too because um, lots of times math is mediated through another language rather than just being presented as the language of math. Um, so I, I, I can't say whether or not that you see that kind of differential effect there. Would you 
Can you talk about, I don't know if this is part of the conversation, so you can tell me no, but can you <laughs> talk about um, how the, um, the pilot is going with AVMR compared to the Ames web? Uh, I can tell you that um, for Bridge Street, they're using many more measures. If I brought in the triangles, they would be very similar to the triangles you've seen for these measures. Um, they start um, with more or less even tricolor um, things, and they go to basically green and yellow triangles by December. Um, actually, they even have some March data in there. Um, things. So from that perspective, I think it's going well. Um, but to really answer the question, we have to get to the overall goals of what RTI is supposed to do. Right. And those goals are to early identify students who are having troubles, get them timely interventions, and um, hopefully, as a result of that, reduce the number of students who are um, showing up later on with more significant learning problems. I think it's too early to say if those goals have been achieved, um, but I can say that right now, I think the teachers are happy that they think the measures are picking out the right kids for interventions. Um, the intervention they're providing is the same intervention as everyone else. Right. Um, right. So, um, well, I think time will tell. Okay, so moving on to the last piece of this, it's just sort of reflections. Um, so, and then the reflections piece was looking at any things that are surprising, anything that was really different than you thought it was going to be, like sort of that one of, wow, I'm surprised. Math is better. I thought reading would be better is the type of thing we look for in this phase. Well, I'm not surprised by it, but I'll just reiterate, it looks like over the course of second to fourth grade or third to fifth grade, our kids are improving, and that's really great to see. And it shows that there's a lot of good work being done. Anyone else want to weigh in before I bring you to a close? Uh, let me just reiterate that. Not surprised. Really happy about the results. Yeah. You know, I think for you, looking at the more specifics, like who is that lowest 10 mm -hmm. for whether preschool or race and all that stuff, I think it's the work that continues, but I'm really pleased with all this um, data. Does math investigations have their own built-in screeners or uh, formative feedback instruments that we implement? They have um, two. They have two unit assessments. Um, one that is developed by Pearson that teachers don't like. Another one that is developed by um, the group that was responsible for the curriculum that teachers like better. And I will add my, my um, weight to that, saying that uh, the, the Turk assessments are much better than the Pearson assessments. They uh, require much more open-ended thinking, deeper thinking, they require kids to explain their answers. The um, Pearson ones are kind of like almost multiple choice, get ready for MCAS kind of things. Um, the, and so there are those. We, we are involved in a discussion right now district-wide and how to best use those and how to um, communicate with parents about student performance on those. But those are not screeners like these are. Um, these are screening for um, general skills that we know are going to be important for whatever math you're doing. Yep. Those assessments are like uh, assessments on what you've just learned to see whether or not you've got the next skill in the developmental sequence that the program lays out. So do we implement those, or are, those, are they commonly implemented, or to somewhat? So as I said, we've been in a discussion. I think what we've found is that they are, there's some variation. Huh? I think they're probably implemented more than not implemented. Um, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to communicate the information, like student performance on those assessments, to parents. So we have some work to do with that. We have kind of all to get on the same page, but that's the stage we're at. Yeah, those assessments. Right. You know, a couple of years from now, those would be interesting to look at. <laughs> Put it on your list. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your attention to this you success much. meeting. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Thank you.
<laughs> Setting traps. <laughs> Your computer's going to get pulled up too. So again, um, thank you, Dr. Provost, and um, this is one of our several um, assessment meetings that we've reserved time um, to just focus on these types of um, assessment types of questions and present data, so we appreciate that. I think the next one is scheduled for summertime, I believe? I think it's either May or June. May or June, okay. May, okay. And I can't remember what the title is. Non-academic measures. Non-academic measures. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much. So we have, um, uh, we have future business and meeting dates. Uh, we have the negotiating subcommittee is scheduled uh, to meet on Monday, April 29th, 2019 at 4.15 p.m. in the NHS library. Um, the ad hoc screen time committee, uh, subcommittee meeting, uh, Monday, May 6th, 2019, in a venue to be determined. Um, and then the school committee's regular meeting, uh, which will be with the um, student advisory committee on Thursday, May 9th at 6.15 p.m. Um, in the JFK community room. So the um, uh, next item on the agenda is a, was a, a placeholder that we put on there that for a potential executive session if um, one was needed um, following the last executive session we had at our last meeting. Um, we do not have a need for that. So um, I would then entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I have um, a all those in favor? Um, it's actually a non-debatable motion. I can okay. answer a question afterwards, okay. but we do have to vote on the motion. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any uh, abstentions? Nay. I'm voting no. Okay. So the, um, so the ayes have it, so the meeting is adjourned.